I'm going to hand over to Claire Thompson, my colleague. She's a lovely young woman. I say young. <laughs> and she threatened me tonight. She said, if you mention the word covenant prayer, I'm going to hit you with my microphone. So uh, I'm, I'm going to stand straight over it. I deny it. Could you get me a thingy? I will. Yeah, I want that thing. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I didn't say anything so threatening at all. Um, good to be with you. And um, to, yeah, tonight we're going to talk about um, starting the year. And I, I actually just thought, you know, in some ways, it's a bit like just facing up to 2022. And um, I put on the first slide for this, this, the news symbol and facing 2022, because I feel a bit like the last couple of years have been just dominated by the news, hasn't it? We all are aware of that, aren't we? That um, possibly more than at any time in our history, the news has sort of figured in our lives. And it's almost like a, the most unified place that we've ever been in. <laughs> that, you know, the, I'm, we're identified with every country in the globe and all the things that have been happening. And the, the news has really dominated our lives. And we've made plans according to the news and what is being said and things like that. And, um, you know, so how do we go into 2022? Is the news the stimulus that will determine how we're going to plot and navigate our way through this year. I wonder whether you're already making plans and wondering what the news will be that will, you know, whether it, something is on or off. Joe over there, she's getting married, Joe and name. You know, they're kind of, I'm sure they're going to be looking at the news, listening to all the little headlines and everything, wondering, is it going to work? It's in Albania. And, um, you know, we've got to fly over there. So can we do it? All that sort of thing. So how do we respond as people who are the people of God, is our life to be determined by the news or is it to be determined by something else, something that comes from an internal place which is not dominated by the external environment? And I don't know if you have had anything happen to you recently that has kind of stopped you in your tracks and reminded you that there's another world to, you know, another way of living, another way of thinking and behaving and being um, that can be really refreshing. So just before Christmas, my sister said to me, um, make sure you're free between seven and eight on Tuesday, the something of December, it was the, the week, the, the Tuesday before Christmas. And she'd been saying it for a month, and so I made sure I was free, and I had no idea what it was for. And um, she came and picked me up, or her husband did, and took us down to Park Street, and I had no idea. I said, do I need to dress up warm? She said, average. So I thought, okay, is that in or out? Don't know. Um, <clears throat> and we ended up in the museum. And I don't know if you've heard of a thing called Secret Bristol. Anyone heard of that? There's secret other cities as well, apparently. Um, but anyway, this it, we were in the museum, and it was all candlelit and in darkness. And we all sat down, and um, had, I still had no idea what we were at. And eventually, what unfolded was a string quartet came and sat down at the front, and then they proceeded to play Swan Lake, the ballet. And a single ballerina appeared from the shadows and danced some of the big scenes from Swan Lake in, by candlelight. And it was magical. <laughs> it was amazing. It was just a really amazing moment, right in the middle of all the hectic nurse of Christmas and the questions and the wondering. And you know, I would, it just something happened to me in that moment as I sat there and I just, everything just calmed down and I just remembered again that life can be beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful things can happen. There are geniuses at work amongst us, inventing amazing bits of music and being able to play brilliantly. And this dancer was flawless in her movements. It was amazing. And as I was just thinking about tonight, I was just thinking, do I live in response to the things that happen to me, the big news things, or am I living from another place? And there was something a bit otherworldly about that evening, and it just reminded me that we're called as 
followers of Jesus to live in response to something beautiful that has happened in the world and something that can warm your heart, to change your heart, to change you. Something that has been done by a genius. And I'm going to play you a film now along the same sort of themes, but this film is a, a little film about um, the restoring of an old painting. And uh, you can find these things on YouTube. There's loads of them. But this one is just a lovely little film about a painting being restored. But as we go into that, I just want you to think about something. A lot the top five New Year's resolutions are getting fit, eating better, losing weight, sorting out your money issues, and getting off social media. Social media before nine o'clock in the morning. Those are the top five, and it's pretty consistent every year. And I was thinking about those things, thinking most people know that we don't stick to these things. I bet he won't. You know, come February, he'll be on it before nine o'clock, won't he? We know that. <laughs> well, maybe he will, pray everyone. Um, but the, the, the fact is, is that people don't keep their resolutions. It's, it's a well-known thing. And, you know, but most all those resolutions are about really us trying to, in some way, restore our lives back into a, a, a sense of order and into the place we feel they should be. And, but actually, I just felt that tonight I wanted to just remind us that God restores us first. And our lives are lived in response to that beautiful act of God. And that is where, why we can make a resolution at all, why we can recalibrate our lives, why we can covenant ourselves back to God. Because first of all, he's done something beautiful in our lives. Now have a look at this film and, and see what you think. isn't it? I want to talk about the God's covenant of restoration that he has made with us that we live in response to. And in, um, in 
Revelation, Jesus says these words, Behold, I'm making all things new. And I don't know if you feel the need for renewal, but most of us do, I think. And particularly in response and reaction to the last couple of years, renewal and restoration is something we need. Our spirits might be flagging. Maybe you've entered the new year raring to go, but most people I know haven't. And uh, in a recent study, three quarters of people feel stuck. That's kind of the majority. Well, it is the majority of us feel stuck, and we need the restoring power of God in our lives. And that is what God does. And we live in response to that. So we're going to read a little story, um, the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a brilliant New Testament character. We hardly know anything about him. He was a tax collector, hated, small man. Whenever Dave preaches about Zacchaeus, he sings a song about him as being a very small man. I'm not going to do that. But we're going to read, read the story of Zacchaeus. And I'm just going to say a few things about how Zacchaeus responded to the restoring power of Jesus and how, um, how it just helps us to see what God can do and how to live. So let's, le- let's just read this now. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's a brilliant story, and you feel a bit like, Oh, give us some more information. But here's three things that I just want to say before we go towards reading a covenant prayer, a prayer of commitment, of recommitment to God. First of all, Only God knows the true measure of you. Now, Zacchaeus was up a tree because he was a small man. He was small in stature, but he's also small in nature. You know, you can see from what he he does. He's not expecting to meet Jesus. He's up a tree to see him as he passes underneath. And Zacchaeus is a very lonely figure. You know, he's hated and he's completely alone. He's Maybe because he's small, he's allied himself with the bullies, you know, which people sometimes say happens that, you know, if you need to cling on to something bigger than you, if you feel insecure, but he's alone and he's hated. He's got no real expectation. He's rich, but he's really poor. And the truth is, is that the fourth most most popular New Year's resolution is to be better with money because money dominates our lives. Why? Because we feel it gives us power. It gives us power over our emotions and we feel sometimes, you know, maybe you're somebody who likes to shop to make you feel better. We know that money dominates and the need for money dominates so many people's lives. And, but of course, there's nothing wrong with money at all. It's that, that need and desire and love of money is all about how am I going to medicate in my life to allow, to, um, to feel some kind of sense of power. And here is a small man who's allied himself with something. And of course, money is not the point. It's what we trust in that shapes us. And I want to ask you the question, you know, what what do you put your trust in that shapes you a bit, that maybe makes you a bit smaller? Is it your temper? Lying? Is it success at work? Is it relationships? Is it status of some kind, the way that you look, those sorts of things? Even your success as a Christian, what do you put your your trust in? And does it make you grow or does it make you shrink? That's a good question 
to go into a week of prayer in, of, and fasting in is, Lord, show me, show me what I'm doing and putting my trust in, what I'm leaning on. Is it making me grow spiritually to be a more mature, more peace-filled, more hope-filled, more healed-up person? Or have I put my trust in things that, is make, that are making me shrink? And underneath, of course, a lot of these things are this array of kind of orphan beliefs that say that my intrinsic value is in something external. And I think Zacchaeus was a, just a classic archetypal sort of person who put his value in external things, trying to get power. But actually, he was a small man with no power, hated and alone. And then he meets Jesus. And, you know, God alone gets you. God alone is the one who really has the true measure of what is going on in your life. And if you want to grow as a person, if you want to recommit your life to God at the beginning of the year, then ask God, measure me. Show me who I am. Show me who I'm becoming. Here are three great questions. Who was I last year? Who could I be? Who am I becoming? Who am I becoming is such a good question to start the year with. And who could you be? Ask God to envision you about those things. You know, that old painting lost its luster because it was old and it got beaten up. And, you know, the varnish that was once there to protect it had gone yellow and it had been ripped and everything. And this master restorer gets to work on that painting knowing that there is some a painting in there that was meant to be beautiful. And only he really can do that job. And I just want to say to you tonight that you're a masterpiece and that God is in the business of restoring you, but he is the only one who has the true measure of you. Ask him, show me who I am. Second thing that happens to Zacchaeus is he meets not hostility, as you would expect, or condemnation or criticism, or actually Zacchaeus, let's sort out this thing, why are you doing this? He meets the mercy of God. He meets Jesus who eyeballs him. And up in that tree, he's absolutely exposed. And one writer says he's probably more exposed than we realized, given the loose clothing of the day and the position that he's in. But there's Jesus looking up at him. And what he meets is not anger or judgment, but mercy and an eyeballing of Jesus saying, I am coming to your house today. And you know, whatever state you're in as you enter 2022, God's saying that to you. I'm coming to your house. I'm coming. I'm coming to be with you. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to sort yourself out. You don't have to do all the right things. You don't have to be a powerful person. You have to just want to see me. Do you want to see God this year? Do you want to? Because if you want to see him and you get yourself into a position to see him, he's coming to your house. He's coming to your house this year. And it's up to you whether you welcome him or you don't. But Zacchaeus did. And only God can see you and eyeball you like that. God looks at you and he doesn't flinch. Isn't that an amazing truth? Do you get that? He looks at you and he sees everything, all the things you've been doing and thinking about, longing for, your silliness, your irrelevancy, your inability to overcome things, those things that you've been doing for years and years and you still haven't overcome. He looks at you and he doesn't flinch. He has the true measure of you and he looks at you with mercy. Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today. And you know, the whole of the gospel is summed up in that sentence. You don't have to clean up to get God to come to your house. You just need to be open. And then something will happen to you. So in Romans 12, it says, in view of God's mercy, I urge you, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The mercy of God comes first. The seeing of God comes first. And then transformation happens. 
So every resolution <laughs> takes its second place under the transforming power of God. Third thing that happens is that we don't know. We do not know what happened in that tea party, but I would love to have known what the conversation went like, the mystery of Jesus talking to Zacchaeus, because he comes out the door at the end of it totally and completely, radically transformed. Every resolution under the, every New Year's resolution wouldn't beat the transformation that Zacchaeus has. So we don't know what happened there. But what happens is the original image of God begins to be revealed in Zacchaeus. You know, a master restorer of a painting knows what it's meant to look like. You're a masterpiece. And God knows what you're meant to look like. So you can resolve to get fit if you like. But God knows what you're meant to look like. And you are a masterpiece. There is no one on earth like you. No one like you. No one has the relationship with God that you do. No one speaks to him like you do. No one thinks like you do. You're totally unique and you're irreplaceable to God. You're a masterpiece. And the Spirit of God wants to restore you. And your life is, be is meant to be lived in response to that restoring power. And what you see is Zacchaeus becoming someone. Not this alone, hated, isolated figure, but someone, human, the image of God, restored in a human being. Only God can do that. And what Zacchaeus does is he then makes a resolution. <laughs> and he makes a really radical resolution. I'm going to give my money away. And if I've cheated anyone, I'm going to pay them back four times over. That kind of radical generosity doesn't come from a New Year's resolution. It comes in response to the touch of God on our lives. And he wants to do that. He wants to call out radical generosity, living power. He wants the healed people to be healers. He wants the freed up people to set other people free. He wants the people who've been made rich in Christ to be generous in the world. And those kind of resolutions are the kind of resolutions that God is aching and waiting to hear from us. And I want to, as we, I'm coming to an end, I want to, we're going to read a covenant prayer. But you know, the, the idea of covenants are uh, um, common in the Bible. They're, they're kind of underpinning the whole understanding of how God and human beings relate to each other. God, a covenant is really an agreement, a binding agreement made between two parties. God on the one side and his people on the other. Now, the people often break covenants, but God never will. And so, but we are called to live in response to the covenant that God has made us. I will act towards you with mercy. I will give you grace. I will restore you. I will heal you. And I'm inviting you to do what Zacchaeus did. Lay it all down. Because that is the only thing you can do in response to God's living power coming into your life is lay it down. Lay down the things that you've been clinging on to for strength or stability or stature that have only shrunk you. Lay it all down and pray a radical, dangerous, risky prayer that says, I'm going to trust you instead of these things. And as we just come to an end now and we look at this prayer, it's an old prayer that's been prayed for probably a couple of hundred years. And it's, pray, it's the Methodist Covenant Prayer. And we often pray it at New Year. But every time we pray it, I find it deeply uncomfortable. It's so hard to pray some of the lines and feel authentic in it. And it's the kind of prayer that you've got to come to, a place of stillness and choose to pray, knowing that you're not really going to be able to live up to it unless the living power of God comes to fill you and enable you to do it. And so we're going to pray it and be asking the Holy Spirit to enable us to live by what we say. And there are some lines in it that, you know, Zacchaeus would have resonated with. You know, let me be laid aside for you. Let me, get, let me have everything. Let me have nothing. Because, you know, when you meet 
the restoring power of God, when you meet Jesus and he looks you in the eye and he says, I'm coming to your house, then all those other things don't seem worth having compared to that. And that is consistent with the whole theme of the New Testament. So I'm going to read this prayer to you, first of all, and you just listen and feel uncomfortable with me. (laughs) And then we're going to stand. And if you want to, you can stand and read it with me. But imagine as we're listening to this, Zacchaeus praying this prayer. I think he would have He would have resonated with it. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with who you will. Can you pray that with truthfulness and honesty? You're willing to be ranked with whoever God puts you with? Put me to the doing. Put me to suffering. Put me to suffering. How does God put us to suffering? Dave was saying earlier to me that his take on that is that if you love someone, you'll probably suffer. Because to love someone is to be called to suffer with them when they're hurting. And sometimes you love goes to a place of suffering to, to carry love into that place. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you, or laid aside for you, exalted for you, or brought low for you. In the eyes of the world, Zacchaeus was being brought low, but not truly. Next one. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. That is a radical prayer, isn't it? And if you would like to begin your year by praying that prayer, then I'm inviting you to stand and we're going to read it out loud together. And, um, and then as we do that, the The band are going to come up and we'll go back into worship. But I just want to encourage you to stay in that place or just to recognize that God is in the act of restoring you. And he is, he's the master restorer. And this prayer is a response. It's not something that's going to get him to love us more. It's out of a response to a loving God who came first. He loved because... We love because he first loved us. So why don't you stand with me? And then I'm going to pray at the end of it. Let's pray out loud together. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with who you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. And I pray, dear God, right now in this place as we, as we pray and worship that you would come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come fall in this room, I pray. You alone know where everyone's at. You know the things that need to be yielded to you. But I pray that your living power would rest on the sacrifice the sacrifice of our agenda in favor of your agenda. Our things that we want in our lives in favor of what you are calling us to. We lay it all down, God. I pray that your spirit would come. Come in healing, restoring power, the master restorer. Heal, I pray. Let there be physical healing. 
Let there be healing of minds. I pray that your soul would experience the living power of God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come in our worship, we pray. Amen.